This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. The November election resulted in a big change in the makeup of the Mecklenburg County Commission. Gone are all the Republicans. For the first time since 1964, the commission is made up entirely of Democrats. The board has four new faces on it, and for the first time, the chairman of the board is a district representative and not one of the at-large commissioners. The fact that the board is now controlled by one party may end up being a double-edged sword for Democrats. Yes, they get to call all the shots unimpeded, but they also have to take the blame should anything go wrong or rub voters the wrong way. And that could happen considering this is the board that will have to deal with whatever fallout comes from the impending property tax revaluation. So this hour, let's meet the four newest members of the Mecklenburg County Commission, one of whom is also the newly elected vice chair. Elaine Powell represents District 1, which covers North Charlotte, Huntersville, Cornelius, and Davidson. She defeated longtime incumbent Republican Jim Puckett. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. First time on the radio? You look like a first time. Are you a first time? It, it, it's my first time on the radio on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Mark Jarrell represents District 4, which covers East Charlotte. He replaced outgoing Democrat Dumont Clark, who stepped down after 18 years. Thank you for being here. And good morning. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, Susan Harden is District 5, uh, or, or her District 5, covers the Southeast Charlotte wedge between Independence and South Boulevard, formerly represented by Republicans. Republican Matthew Ridenhauer, thank you for joining us. Good morning. And Susan Rodriguez McDowell's District 6 covers a wide swath in the southern part of the county, and she ousted longtime Republican Bill James. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I just found out, thanks to uh, uh, Elaine Powell, that you all have been campaigning together for the better part of this last year. H how did I miss that? What have you been doing? Well, when, when you campaign, you um, end up going to a lot of the same events together. And so I think that one of the nice things about the energy between us is that we have taken the time of campaigning to get to know each other. And we actually really like each other and are looking forward to serving together. I think we have a, we have a bond and a friendship. And I think that relationship building is going to go a long way this coming year. I just want everybody to know that everybody's nodding in agreement. If you're not watching us on Facebook mm -hmm. Live, it's, it's on radio. You can't see that, but they're all nodding in agreement. And by the way, if you want to join our conversation, you can. You can email us at charlottetalks at wfae.org. Get to WFAE on Facebook or search, or search for us on Twitter at uh, Charlotte Talks. In, in, in the weeks since the election, we have talked to numerous politicians and political scientists about what happened on Election Day here and around the country and just how big the so-called blue wave wave was, the county commission arguably is the place where this really came into focus because you are all Democrats, as I mentioned in, in the opening. Why, why do you think voters made that decision? I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Elaine Powell. In District 1, uh, I traveled on the campaign trail. I traveled to every, I felt like every street uh, in District 1 to talk to people, to hear what was important to them. And I think that people's, people just want to have their voices heard. Um, and I think that in my case, uh, some people felt like their voices weren't being heard. And I have never asked anybody if their political affiliation when they are talking to me, because I feel like anyone's input is so important. And it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. I just want to know what your point of view is. And I think people felt that uh, and knew it when I was talking to them. So in my case, mm -hmm. uh, I think people's voices wanted to be heard. Susan uh, McDowell. Uh, in my case, I think in District 6, uh, people believed in my message. And it was one about representation, about wanting to uh, show up and be there and uh, be present in the community. And I think people weren't used to that sort of approach um, from the previous uh, commissioner. So I think that was a big part of it. Mark. Yeah, I, I have to echo with what Susan and Elaine said. I think it's messaging. I think it was, you know, grassroots getting out on the ground and, and um, just uh, ensuring that everyone's voice was, was being heard. Mm. 
my case is a little bit different from these guys because after the primary, I didn't have a uh, general election opponent, but I had the opportunity to see them and, and we were still in the same places and it definitely message uh, resonated. Why do you think you didn't have an opponent? Well, I think the demographics of my district are, are a little different. I think um, for a Republican in District 4, it's, a, it's definitely an uphill battle, but that's not to say that uh, we don't have a, a message that resonates with, with everyone in our district. Susan Harden. Yeah, I think just the opposite. I think that people were surprised that a Democrat could win District 5, mm -hmm. and I think that it was about hard work, it was about organizing, it was about a message of education and health care, and that, that superseded any kind of political boundary. Mm. Well, you want, you beat Matthew Ridenour. I did. Uh, and we had Matthew Ridenour on the program, I think, last week. And one of the things he has said about this is that he, he had an experience at, at the polling place where somebody came up and said, I like you, I like what you've done, but I simply cannot vote for you because you are a Republican. I'm not voting for any Republicans. None of you mentioned the Trump effect. None of you mentioned the changing demographics of Mecklenburg County as having added to your or contributed to your election victory here. Did, did that not play a role in your mind? Absolutely. In my mind, uh, District 6 has changed tremendously over the past 22 years. And so uh, it's growing. It's one of the fastest growing areas in the county. And so I do think that was a big part of it. We never mentioned Trump on the campaign trail. We did. Uh, that, that just wasn't part did he, of Did he not come up? Um, absolutely. Not, not by you, but by yeah. people you're talking to? They, they didn't um, mention him? You know, they didn't really. I, I think people are kind of tired of yeah. talking about <laughs> yeah. national politics. I think that we were trying to talk about how important local mm -hmm. decisions are for people's lives. I think that, I think that, I think that one thing we did try to talk about is integrity and truth. Mm -hmm. And so, while I certainly didn't talk about Trump by name, I wanted to put forward, and I think we all did, candidates that um, embodied certain values and civic characteristics that we thought were important. So yeah. let, let me stick with you for a second, Susan, because you beat Matthew Ridenhauer. He was a moderate Republican who was known for reaching across the aisle and trying to work things out with Democrats, and yet you defeated him, and you, you, you did so without talking about Donald Trump and just stressing truth. Are you, you're not saying that he didn't tell the truth, are you? No, I, I think Matthew okay. Ridenauer did certainly tell the truth, All absolutely. Right. But I'm just saying that I think that people were looking for candidates who um, were different than what they were seeing on the national level. So how will your – this goes to all of you, but I'll start with Susan Harden. How will your leadership be different <clears throat> than that of your predecessor? I mean, I think that one of the things that I bring that my district was definitely interested in is an expertise in education. I can tell you that District 5 has some of the um, largest high schools. We have Myers Park High School with now 3,500 students, the largest district, high school. District in, 5 includes Cotswold. Cotswold, Myers Park, South Charlotte. And so we have, um, we have um, so education is a top concern, and I am a professor of education at UNC Charlotte. I bring a strong understanding about uh, and a vision for what I think our schools can be. So I think that that's one thing, that and, and just an expertise about a subject that I think is of critical importance to my district. Okay. Susan Rodriguez-McDowell, you replaced Bill James. How will your leadership be different? <laughs> yeah, well, as I said before, I think uh, being present. Uh, being present is uh, something that uh, I will do differently. And uh, emphasis on relationship building, um, that is just one of the areas I'm most interested by in. By being present, do you mean accessible? Because uh, yeah. Bill James did a lot of things by tweet and Facebook mm, post, and, right. and he showed up for the meetings, but he didn't do a lot of um, going out into the community. As I said before we started, he never came on this show live in right. person. He was on the phone, but he wouldn't come out. Are you are you talking about accessibility as opposed to being present? Um, when I say present, I mean I, I'm planning and I have been in the community showing up at events, um, out talking to people, out uh, interacting with folks. Um, and and I think that's really important that people see. Mm -hmm. They see you and they hear you and they they 
uh, what, what, what I want to do is, is be someone that brings uh, what's happening at the county level to the towns um, because I do have three towns in my district. Um, and so I do pa plan on being very present to those towns and, uh, and to the others in my district. Elaine Powell, you replaced Jim Puckett, who had the opposite. Uh, he wasn't like Bill James at all. He was very present. He was very vocal. He was a leader. He, he, whether you agree with his point of view or not, he was a leader on key issues that faced the, the district that he represented and also the community at large. How will you be different? Uh, first, I want to say I have a great deal of respect for Commissioner Puckett, and, and he did a lot of good work in the community, and he loves the community. Um, the way that I differ is I have 29 years of community experience. Uh, on the, so I have the flip side, you know, some people have a lot of experience in elected leadership. I have 29 years of experience in community leadership. Yeah, I should bring that up. You were, and maybe you still are, I don't know, a park and rec commissioner, <laughs> member of the County Natural Resources Stewardship Advisory Council, the Mecklenburg County North Park Region Advisory Council, the Mecklenburg County Waste Management Advisory Board, and that just scratches the surface. Yes. What motivates you? Why all these different boards and councils and commissions? What's up? When I grew up, it was part of a family value system of um, using your strengths and talents to help others. And so it was modeled throughout my life in my family and in school. And I grew up believing that that is an important thing to do and, and have done that in my life. What, what, what do you see as your strengths and talents? Uh, I'm a very good listener, and I really like to hear different points of view. I think that we all have different life experiences that add to making better decisions. So I, I love to hear different points of view. Yeah. People say, you know, well, look at it from this point of view, or what if this? I enjoy that, and I think that's an important part of uh, elected leadership, making sure that we listen to different points of view so that we can make healthy decisions. I'm going to come back to that in a second, but Mark, I want to get your answer to how you see your leadership being different, or in your case, because you're replacing Dumont Clark, a fellow Democrat who just chose not to run again, how it will be similar to what Dumont Clark did. Sure. Um, for me, you know, replacing Dumont, uh, I have huge shoes to fill. He served uh, 18 years faithfully to the people of District 4. Uh, the people respect him. They love him. There's intellect is really unmatched. And uh, for me, I'm going to continue to do the things that I've been doing in the community. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been someone who's been volunteering and, and, and working hard and, and trying to affect change in a positive way, whether that was through uh, the Black Political Caucus or running campaigns and, and trying to get uh, good people elected. Uh, I think where my value add comes in is that uh, my thought process on what we can do as commissioners uh, is, is probably not the in the traditional sense of, of what we've been uh, accustomed meaning, to. Meaning? Meaning uh, impacting affordable housing, uh, looking at uh, the way we, we look at education and accountability and, and uh, equity and uh, uh, priority when it comes to open space, parks and rec, and, and um you know, those types of issues. And I think that was what resonated with people while we were all on the campaign trail. Uh, there was just a different thought process. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I don't have time to ask this question because we're about to go to a break, but I'll give you a chance to think about it. I'll, I'll give you a little preview of the question because you mentioned, uh, 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 Elaine, uh, that you're a good listener and that you like listening to different points of view from different people. And all of you, I believe, when I read about you yesterday, uh, mention listening as being an important part of this process of being on county commission. Everybody has an opinion. And if you listen to their opinions, then what do you do? Because it may not agree with your opinion. It may not agree with the prevailing opinion. It may not agree with what you think is right or where you want to take the city or the county in, in this case. So what do you do with all that? How do you synthesize that? We'll get an answer to that when we come back. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Signature Healthcare, offering concierge pediatric services with same-day sick visits, 24-hour access to pediatricians, and an array of in-office services, including x-rays. Details at SignaturePediatrics.org. And great outdoor provision company, outfitting the Carolinas since 1972, featuring gift wrapping with brown paper packages tied up with string in support of North Carolina public lands. 
Tomorrow on this program at 9 o'clock, details of election fraud in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District continue to unfold. It gets weirder and weirder with every passing day. So we've invited three political experts on to dissect it all, and they'll do it tomorrow at 9. A little reminder that we're taking our Charlotte Friday News Roundup on the road on Friday to 7th Street Public Market Uptown. Uh, You can join us there, and you can get details on how to do that at our website at WFAE. Standing in line at the post office can be a holiday tradition. So too is the fact that the U.S. Postal Service has become a loss-making enterprise. The post office is written into the Constitution, but could we live without it? I'm Joshua Johnson. Should this public service go private? Next time on 1A from WAMU and NPR. 1A coming up at 10 right after Charlotte Talks. Here on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE. Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We have the four newest members of the Mecklenburg County Commission with us today. Elaine Powell represents District 1. Uh, Mark Durrell, uh, District 4. Susan Harden, District 5. Susan Rodriguez McDowell, District 6. And just before the break, I asked you how you synthesize what you hear, what you're hearing from constituents, whether you agree with them or not, whether it's a good idea or not so you listen but you didn't act on what i told you so you're 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 not representing me what do you do with that information how do you make it work for you well i think that um you know listening is one of the deepest forms of civic engagement you can do for a person a, a, a citizen i mean everybody wants to be heard and i think that um when you're not heard as a citizen you want to be heard and you want to be treated fairly mm-hmm. and so when you're when those two things take place i think that you see a rise in civic engagement and i think that that's one thing that we all care about is that we really care about our communities and we want people to be engaged so so I, you know to hear only from one perspective i think goes against the idea of caring for your community and community engagement you want to hear from everybody absolutely Nationally, a lot of people have felt unheard, and that's why we have such division in the country, why we have such anger in the country about political points of view. And and, and the people who felt unheard, uh, at least when they elected Donald Trump, took it out on Democrats. How will you be better? Well, I think that I think that um, you, what you're seeing now is a rise of candidates who've never served office before. Mm. I mean. <laughs> from the, the four top of down. Us, from, from the <laughs> bottom up. I mean, the four of us have never served elected office before. Yeah. We, you know, so I think that what you're seeing is p- kind of new people stepping into the space. You uh, folks, and, and I mean by you folks, I mean the county commission, the eight members, uh, you're, you're among the eight members of the county commission that voted for District 3 Representative George Dunlop to be the chair of the commission. Historically and traditionally, it has been the at lar- an at-large member, and usually the at-large member who's gotten the most votes because they are, are representing the most people. You chose a district representative. Why? I think um, the what we wanted was a fresh start, and um, in in our situation that we had, and, and yet he's an old timer on the board. An old timer, you could have elected a, one of yourselves as a, if you wanted a fresh start. Well, it was a, a fresh start as chair. Um, the other, the previous uh, at large folks have all served as chair in the past. Okay. And so, um, so when we say a fresh start, we're saying uh, we're giving George our support as a fresh start as chair. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we. And if Lane as vice chair. Um, we have someone yes, we who do. is newly elected right. and, and uh, who served the community 29 years, and, and uh, we feel really comfortable with what she brings and what she adds to the board. Did you want that job? Did it come as a surprise to you that they gave you the vice chair of the board? It, it's an honor. Um, I'm always willing to do what is necessary uh, to get the job done, and I do have a lot of experience with the flip side. So the whole infrastructure of citizen engagement that county government has with advisory boards, advisory commissions, and councils. I I have experience with that of making sure that when we are making decisions, uh, that we are asking for citizen input from those levels in addition to outreach to the community. Go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say another important uh, 
<laughs> Another important part of the decision was we did want to have someone with experience to walk through this revaluation process. Um, we knew this was going to be an important year to have some leadership that uh, was experienced. Well, uh, following the election, your predecessor, Elaine, uh, Jim Puckett, former Republican commissioner, says it is the Democratic Party that has been in charge. You are now completely in charge because they were on the, the Republicans were in the minority. And he laid at Democrats' feet responsibility for problems such as lack of affordable housing, deficiencies in the school system. He said, I look forward to you solving those in the next two years. I'm not really sure how you're going to do it, but you won't be bothered by the Republicans getting in your way. Is that sour grapes or simply the re the hard, cold reality? Oh, that's the reality. I mean, the fact of the matter is all of us were elected to do this job, and I'm looking forward to taking on those issues. The voters should hold us accountable. Uh, I think we all, all of us come with a mandate and a, an aggressive agenda to deal with those issues that uh, Mr. Puckett laid out. And um, I guess, um, you know, I just ask that um, – voters uh, give us a chance. I think they're going to be surprised with, hopefully pleasantly surprised, with what we deliver. Why? Why do you think that? Well, I think that, um, I think that all of us have um, are very clear and strategic about how we're going to go about our business. I think that we are very, we're not a lot of game players here. We're really focused on what's best for the community. And I think that, uh, I think that the, the community is going to be pleasantly surprised. Mark Jarrell. Mike, it, it, I really think it's important for us to, to take a step back and, and really understand that if, if we're serious about solving problems, that we can't retreat to our respective camps and corners. Uh, I don't think any of our problems can be solved by a party. Um, we are open to, to hearing from everyone. And I, and I personally believe it's important for us to hear from everyone. Um, I don't care if they have a D, a D. And R next to their name, we've got serious community problems that, right. that have to be solved together. And but, I, don't, I don't see how we can do that if um, alone. But and you I, all have D's after your names, and that's going to be held up by people who have R's after their names. So this, this fact that you run everything now, including the city council, uh, does that fact make you bolder? in your decision making or does it make you look over your shoulder and say well we better temper these democratic ideals a little bit because there are republicans out there who are looking very carefully at us i mean i don't think that we're we're putting forward democratic ideals i think we're putting forward good ideas okay. and so wherever they come from right. republicans democrats unaffiliated there's as many unaffiliated in my districts as there are republicans or democrats i think we're looking for good ideas bring on your good ideas we're listening Absolutely. And one thing I just want to add is our problems are really uh, going to be long-term solutions, not not quick. And I don't think any of us are thinking we're just going to come in here and in our little two-year terms and fix all the all the problems that are, have been systemic over years and years. So um, Historically, and this may not be true because if you look at the national situation, uh, historically Republicans have position themselves as being fiscally conservative. We have the biggest national debt in our history right now, and mm. Republicans are in charge. But nonetheless, that's how they positioned themselves. And in fact, on county commission, Republicans have acted as a stopgap, or at least uh, the little voice in the back of your mind saying, eh, maybe I better hold off on this expense. For instance, uh, Jim Puckett can be credited for leading efforts against subsidizing that major league soccer stadium that would have cost $100 million. And now you, you folks are facing tax tax revaluations, and historically Republicans have kind of put the brakes on things without that voice in your ear sitting on the commission dais with you. How will you act? I mean, you know, the voice in my ear is my, my neighbor who lives next door to me who's, you know, 85 years old who lives on a fixed income. The voice in my ear is the teachers who live in my district who – you know, are trying to um, not, you know, many of them, 70% of them work second jobs. And so I don't think anybody here wants to create a community that's not affordable. And so I think you're going to see balance. I think you're going to see an eye for um, livability on, uh, you know, all ends of the financial spectrum. If I had the uh, old, the longer serving members uh, of the county commission around this table this morning, would they echo those thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I think... 
I think if you look at how the county's been managed, I think that, you know, we have a triple A bond rating. I think that our, our county, the finances of our county are really in sound physical shape. I, I, I don't think you can look at the, the financial health of the county of the county and think that it's been nothing but well done and well managed. Mm. That's Susan Harden. I'll, I'll mention your name because nobody's heard your voice before. So that's <laughs> Susan Harden. She's here with Elaine Powell and Susan Rodriguez McDowell and Mark Durrell, all of the new members of uh, uh, County Commission. Let me go around the table very quickly, and we'll talk about these ideas and, and these what I'm about to ask you in, in greater depth. I just want to hear very quickly what you think are the most serious problems facing Mecklenburg County, the issues that you would like to tackle first. And I'll start with Mark. We'll just go left to right. Mark. Yeah, so quickly, I'd say affordable housing, uh, number one. If you work here, you should be able to afford to live here in our community, uh, economic mobility, uh, our parks and rec, our open space, uh, connectivity with our greenways, and, and um, our park maintenance is something that, that's critical to the people in, in uh, my district. Um, our, our education is huge. I mean, ensuring that our teachers are, are paid, uh, ensuring that uh, our classrooms are equipped for 21st century learning. We'll talk about, we'll talk about all these in depth, but I, I sure. want to hear the thumbnails sure. first. Okay, uh, uh, Susan I, I, Harden. I mean, I think my, uh, my number one mandate is um, education, and certainly, um, you know, my vision for the community is what if all the great teachers move to Charlotte-Mecklenburg? Elaine? Uh, my number one priority is citizen engagement and making sure that uh, citizens' voices are heard. My number two is environmental stewardship. Um, really looking forward to creating an environment committee where we talk about protection of natural resources. My big concern, huge concern, is the explosive growth in Mecklenburg County. Um, how do we meet the needs of, you know, meet the current needs and meet the future needs on a limited amount mm. of money? Um, so how do we create a livable Mecklenburg County? Mm. Susan McDowell. Um, I would have to echo uh, all of my colleagues here, and education is definitely um, one of the biggest things we have to work on. Um, I think um, also the affordable housing issue, really inequality, um, racial and income inequality, uh, segregation, um, these are the things that, that I just think we need to begin to reverse. So none of you mentioned the thing that I, I want to talk about first, uh, which I think is fascinating because it, it, everything you want to do requires money. Almost everything you want to do requires money. And we're facing the first property revaluation in eight years. And the last time we had a property revaluation, it was an unmitigated disaster. And it caused a lot of problems. We lost a county manager over it. We lost, I think, the budget director over it. Uh, this, we know, after eight years, we know property values will rise. I think they're estimated to rise 44% for residential property owners and about 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent for uh, commercial property owners. Uh, that doesn't mean taxes have to go up. It no. just means that the property values are going up. So is it, in, is it your intent to keep the tax rate, uh, what is it called, Value, uh, uh, revenue neutral? Revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. It is mine. <clears throat> it is, it is mine. Yeah, it is mine to keep it revenue neutral. And any, th any increase, I, need, I think, needs to be very transparent and have a lot of citizen input on that if there is any increase. But I'm committed to revenue neutral. I'm not committed to anything yet because I, I haven't learned enough about, um, you know, the impact of, of everything. But, but that's definitely my bent is to be toward revenue neutral. I think that the process has been much improved this time. We're going to see a big change in, in how this whole thing is rolled out. I think that, um, that the county has done a tremendous job of educating and engaging with the citizens already. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Joyner has done so many engagements. I don't know how many. Over, over 100. 20 or something. A ton. Yes. Yeah. And so I don't think it's going to be the same sort of process that we saw the last time. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're fortunate that we're in a growing community. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the ways that you can fund the things that we want to do is through growth. And we're lucky that, that we have people moving here and bringing, 
you know, new revenue into the community just by fact of moving here. And so I don't think I, we're, we're, but, we're in a but, fortunate place to make decisions. But more people means more need for infrastructure, more, more classroom, more seats Absolutely. in the classrooms, Absolutely. more pipes and, and trash collection and, and, and more health care and, and things like that. You, that's right. It pays for itself or well, not? Well, I mean, I think that that's the question that we're going to dig into in the budget because committee. Years ag- but because but years it's ago, better than being in a devaluation where your Certainly. property values are going down, where people are leaving your community. We're in a we're in a good situation. But years ago, when this growth spurt that we're under that we've been living through now for ten years was just beginning, uh, there was we had large conversations on the show with county commission and city council and and uh, leaders in in city and county government saying that there's always a lag time between growth and the need for in infrastructure to support that growth and, and, and where you need to be. There's a lag time, and it, and it requires money. It, it re- requires an outlay of cash first, which will get paid back later. You're saying you're not so sure about that? Well, what I'm saying is, is that I think now is the time. We're going to have some visionary leadership. We're going to have new plans at the city and the county level. We're going to have a school board that's going to be tackling these issues. I think what you're going to see now is three bodies coming together to lay out a vision for the community that we can all get behind. I don't think we're going to act in our silos anymore. I think we're going to work together. Let me hear from you on this too, Mark, Uh, 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 because Pat Cotham, one of the Democratic, your fellow commissioner, Pat Cotham, says she's worried about the loss of the collective wisdom of the Republicans who are leaving the board because they went through this before, this property revaluation before, and they may have some things to say about what happened before that they could help you avoid the pitfalls. Yeah, well, I I think, you know, we're committed to hearing from everyone. Uh, As we said earlier, I I don't think anyone's voice will be lost. You know, I, I... respectfully disagree with with Pat's point on this. Uh, She's a friend, and uh, I respect her immensely. But uh, we're committed to taking in all the information and uh, making the best decision once we've had a chance to really digest that and hear from everyone. The mayor of Charlotte, Vi Lyles, who's not part of your organization, but the mayor will be here on Thursday because it's our monthly a conversation with Mayor Lyles, and one of the things that she has been talking about forever now has been affordable housing. We have the $50 million in bonds that passed on Election Day specifically for affordable housing. Uh, you've all mentioned that affordable, I think you, you certainly have mentioned, Mark, that affordable housing is top of mind for you. Obviously, keeping the taxes revenue neutral will help in that because if you raise taxes, that decreases the chance you're going to be able to hit the numbers for affordable housing. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So how do you increase the stock of affordable housing? What role does the county have to play in that? So, I mean, the county has a lot of assets, you know, that we, we're, we're just starting to understand the issue of affordable housing and how the county can play a larger role. I think that you have people on – this, uh, the fresh four want to um, engage this issue more deeply. I think that the county has some tremendous assets that we can bring in. We also know that when we act in a coordinated fashion, we, we're going to be providing services to make sure that the investments in affordable housing pay the highest dividends to the community. Anybody else want to chime in on this? About how you do this? Or is this a city role? Traditionally, it has always been a city role. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we are exploring uh, how we can be part of a solution. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is a county county role is the funding of Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. And I know that you're particularly interested in in schools, Susan Harden, because as you say, you're a professor of education. Uh, We're going to come back and talk about that, about economic uh, economic opportunity and upward mobility, racial and income inequality, and the role all of that plays, uh, if you solve that, in making this a better place to live. We're coming right back at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Bradley, a full-service law firm with attorneys that are experienced in serving the banking and financial services industry in Charlotte and across the nation. Details at Bradley.com. And Duke Energy, investing in technology designed to modernize the Carolina's energy grid over the next 10 years. More at Duke-Energy.com slash future. President Trump's administration recently released a report that recommended a revamp 
for the U.S. Postal Service. So what does the future of the Postal Service look like? Joshua Johnson and his guests look into that coming up in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock during 1A. And we will continue our conversation with our four new members of the Mecklenburg County Commission who have stayed this long into the show. (laughs) We're coming right back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Nick Delacanal, host of FAQ City, where we find the answers to the Charlotte area's big questions. And I have a question for you. What kind of podcast should WFAE produce next? Submit your idea to WFAE's Queen City PodQuest, and you might just win a cash prize or a podcast series. Learn more at WFAE.org slash Queen City PodQuest. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking this morning with the four new newest members of County Commission. They're all newly elected first timers. Uh, the, the chairman or the vice chair, rather, of the County Commission is Elaine Powell. She represents District 1, which used to be uh, represented by uh, Jim Puckett. Puckett. She is with us. Mark Jarrell is with us. He took the place of Dumont Clark. It represents District 4. Susan Harden represents District 5. Matthew Ridenauer's old district. And uh, Susan Rodriguez McDowell took over for Bill James in District 6. By the way, Dumont Clark just emailed us to say that we did not lose our budget director after the last revaluation. The county changed tax assessors. I get the two. I told you Dumont's intellect was (laughs) unmatched. (laughs) And the city, he says, collects trash, not the county. It's we once did a show years ago about what the city does and the county does. We maybe we should repeat that show because I don't remember what the city and the county does. And that's You're part not of the alone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so one of the county's biggest budget items is Charlotte Mecklenburg School. CMS says it is chronically underfunded, and some of you have stressed the importance of public education. You are an educator, Susan Harden, and, and that includes uh, you include this in your priorities. A strong, high quality schools, higher teacher pay, more pre-K, and affordable college education. That all takes money. How do you achieve that? And is it just money? When you talk about quality education, is it just money? Well, I think in terms of teacher pay, it's an economic problem with an economic solution. Nationwide, we have about 100,000 teacher shortage annually. We're competing for the best teachers across the nation. Um, I think that um, we talk about you know, competing for the best companies in Charlotte. I want to see us competing for the best teachers in Charlotte. But we keep throwing it – is, it is perception that we keep throwing money at schools. At the same time, we keep throwing them all the responsibilities for society's problems and say, hey, fix this, and oh, also make them read and write. Uh, yeah, I don't think – I think these are investments. I think that the success of America is because of our investments in education. I think that um, I think that this is part of what we do as a society is that we educate folks, and those educational investments are economic elevators that that push our economy forward. But I think it's important to realize as well um, when we talk about all of our issues, they're they're all interconnected. Yes. And and I think if if we keep looking at these issues in isolation, it's it's very difficult to solve. I mean the. You know, when you talk about education, you have to talk about uh, livable wages, breaking up pockets of poverty Absolutely. that we have in our community, uh, racial equity, uh, injustice, and, and so many other elements go into this pot that we have to look at comprehensively. And how do you, you're right, we've talked about this before, and that was my next couple of topics, economic opportunity and upward mobility, and we know that we struggle with both. Uh, in in Charlotte, but we provide K through 12 free public education, and it all starts with education, all of it, and yet some people are falling through the cracks. Why and how do you fix that? I mean, we've got a community, uh, frankly, we have two separate communities, unfortunately. Um, We have one of, of poverty and we have one of prosperity. And while if we continue down that path, I mean, the gap is only going to increase. And so we have really ha- we really have to look at these issues of, of inequity in the community and, and get investments not just from um, the public sector, but the private sector has to be a, a major contributor here and, and our nonprofits and 
uh, we have to we have to make this a, a true community effort. So Charlotte Mecklenburg, Mecklen, Mecklenburg Schools used to be the poster child for successful integration of school systems in the country. We have, we are told, a sterling reputation nationally, and yet people, except when they have kids in their particular school, have this negative impression of CMS, and that all we do is throw money, good money after bad, and nothing ever happens, nothing ever gets better. How would you assess Charlotte Mecklenburg School? I want to leave you out of this for a second, Susan Harden, because you're the education that will finish with you. How would you assess this, Elaine? Personally, you yeah, know, personally. my son had an excellent education in CMS K through 12. Um, I volunteered in CMS for 25 years. So uh, personally, I've seen exactly what Mark is talking about. Um, two different systems. I've, I've seen, I started off as a community partner at Eastway Middle School. And at that time in 1989, I had never seen such poverty in, in a school and even was greeted by a policeman at the front when I arrived to volunteer in 1989. Um, it was very surprising. So uh, there, are, there are examples of excellence, and then there are examples of we really need to, to help. How do you explain that? Why, why do we have two systems? Why? Well, I wish I knew the exact answer, okay. uh, but... It, it is, everything is interconnected, and um, and I don't want to speak for the school board. Like right. I want us, and I think we all agree to have a really good relationship with the school board. But you help fund the schools; that's part of your job. Ex so, how do you assess the schools, and how do you decide whether money is the solution to their problems, or whether you have to fix? other things that have nothing to do with the schools first before you can fix the schools and what do you do in the interim? This is really a complicated issue. I know it is. It's impossible. It's very complex, um, but I think, you know, especially with my history of volunteering in the schools for 25 years and seeing what a huge difference PTA and school leadership team can make in each school uh, and understanding the importance of the relationship mm -hmm. and collaborating with the school board, I think that we can better understand things and move forward towards solutions. Mark? Yeah, you know, Mike, uh, your question makes me think about just the other day I, I spoke at a school where uh, it's 99 percent children of color, 34 uh, percent of the children are classified as homeless. Mm. And, um, and, and I, I want to reiterate that, 34 percent. I, I'm I'm not really sure how children that are homeless can come to school prepared right. to learn, right. um, and I think in our community, um, you know, we have to measure ourselves by our weakest link, and and if we're using that standard, um, it's going to be impossible to give us a good grade. Which leads to economic opportunity and upward mobility, uh, which is part of the problem here in Charlotte. Those are issues that we've been grappling with for a long time now. Uh, where do you begin? Because this the economic opportunity is uh, you have to deal with private employers for the most part and encouraging them to hire people and take a chance on people and promote people over, the, over time so that they can rise through the ranks. I think one of the most... What role does government play in that? So I think one of the most conservative approaches to the issues is to deal with fairness and justice. I'm, I'm not advocating for more programs. I'm advocating for treating people fairly. If you pay women the same wage as you pay men, you address economic mobility. If you pay African Americans the same wage you pay, we pay white folks, you address economic mobility. But people aren't asking for more or, or, or to be treated specially. They just wanted to be treated fairly. But how do you do that? How does a government in, in, a, in a capitalist democracy or republic you model that. that. You talk about it. You you use your you use your position to 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 appeal to these to fairness and justice. And so I think that I think that leaders in the private industry and across our community want that. It's just saying this is one way to deal with um, economic. Um, mobility is to treat people fairly. We have to model uh, livable wages as yes. well. So it, it, in government, I mean, that those are certain areas that, that we can control. 
So to ensure that everyone that works for uh, the county and the city uh, have livable wages, I think is really, really important for the, the private sector to try to model that as well. Is there an appetite for that in the private sector? Can they be, do they need to be shamed into it? Can you arm twist? Can you provide incentives? What do you have to do? Well, I, I'm, I'm not for shaming, but I am for, I'm in, am in for partnerships and inviting people into the space to have conversations about it. Again, I think that the, I, I think that the business leaders want all kinds of people in their community and that they recognize that people, we, people are hardworking. They just want to be treated fairly. I think it's important to the, the idea of leadership and, and showing and demonstrating why is this good for business, you know why? Why is that good? And 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 another piece I just wanted to bring to it is is the idea of, of uh, the fact that we've segregated ourselves so much, and I think that really leads to so many problems that we have. And so if we can, as leaders, as community leaders ourselves, but also um, if we can uh, encourage others to desegregate ourselves. Um, that would help desegregate our schools. Peter on Facebook writes, I have lived in Charlotte for 50 years. I have heard these promises to fix everything from both Republicans and Democrats. When, when will we see solutions to affordable housing, income inequality, education, etc., rather than promises? We need public will. I think that's one thing we, we really need is the Big public to, right. uh, to, to commit yeah. to So it. we're waiting for you to solve our problems, and we need to solve our well, problems. Well, I mean, we it? invite Peter to come speak to the Board of County Commissions. One of the things that we, I think mm -hmm. all of us would like to see, and what I'm encouraging folks to do, is know that if they come before the dais, that we're listening. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I, and I think to Peter's point, I think one of the reasons why all of us ran um, was because we were always hearing about the same issues over and over. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, for me, I can say a, a huge driver was the fact that I wanted to connect the activism with specific policy. Two years ago, when the Young Turks, I'll, I'll use that term for lack of a better one, uh, won on city council, uh, they kept saying, and, and, I, and Mayor Lyles also said during the campaign, the time for talk is over. The time for action has come. Are you saying the same thing? Absolutely. Without question. So how do you know where to, where to start? Because one of the things that you mentioned, uh, Elaine, is uh, you wanted to set up an environmental committee. You have all these other problems. How, where does the environment come into all of this? Can you think of anything more important than clean air and clean water, clean soil? I mean, nothing else matters. Don't we have that? Uh, no. Uh, okay. These are these are issues that need to be addressed and thought through and have a comprehensive plan going forward to make sure that we don't end up like Detroit. Uh, but definitely a, a top priority. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? I mean, we just we're going to go to work today. We're going to go to work next Tuesday. We're working every day on these issues. We're going to create um, some strategic plans. We're going to talk with our partners at CMS and the city. And uh, I mean, I'm proud of the things that the city has accomplished with the new energy that they've that and I certainly want to I, I admire my colleagues there, and I, I want to. I hope to accomplish as much as they've done in the short period of time they've been there. One thing we haven't talked about is the problems at the Mecklenburg County Health Department. Uh, we witnessed uh, about a year or two ago the uh, failure to inform about 185 women that their Pap smear tests were inaccurate. Uh, Channel Nine was inadvertently supplied patient information, medical information. Not it wasn't their fault. It was the health department's fault. And, and it was pointed out that during all this debate about this that Mecklenburg County is the only county in the state that operates its health department without independent medical oversight. In May, the old county commission voted 6-2 to two to form an ad hoc committee to explore potential changes at the health department. The committee never met. This now falls to you. Uh, knowing what happened in the past, have you given any thoughts to how things should change? You're the vice chair, uh, Elaine. I'll put, well, the, I'll put the bug on you. And so we, we've asked for more information on this, and in fact, I think we'll be getting some today. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to carry on with, uh, you know, Commissioner Puckett wanted to have this ad hoc committee to look at um, possibly having um, medical professionals 
uh, available f for a board. Because right now the county commission is that board of health. Correct. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I I like his idea, okay. and so I hope to champion that going forward and to get you know really get some information and and look into that and and go forward because you know it's uh, logical that you would have medical health professionals looking over and guiding the health department. We have two minutes left, and Mark, you've been outnumbered all morning here, and I, I get the feeling that you're going to continue to be. <laughs> because <laughs> along with the blue wave in this last election, we also experienced nationally a pink wave. Uh, more women have been elected to office than ever before. That was also the case on county commission. How do you think the presence of more women will impact what decisions are made and how decisions are made? Mm. So, I mean, now we have six women on the county commission. Yeah. I mean, we felt like it was important that a woman be in a leadership role. We're thrilled that Elaine Powell is, is taking on that. And, uh, but we have, you know, six strong women. And I think that, um, I think that uh, you know, we're looking forward to um, being collaborative. We're looking forward to listening. We're looking forward to taking care of issues, you know, that focus in on the home, like education and health care. I think uh, what you said about being um, collaborative, uh, being relational, uh, yeah. especially with the other, with CMS, with city council, um, you know, I think that as women, maybe we have a little bit different approach. We also only have 30 seconds left, but we've also heard about the importance of diversity in governing bodies. And at the county commission level, this last election saw the loss of four white guys. They were all voted out uh, or chose not to, to run. Uh, they were replaced by three white women and an African-American man. There are now no white men on county commission. What should we take from this, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we should take from this that uh, the community and the people are ready for everyone to have a voice and that uh, no one should feel isolated. Mark Jarrell, who is in District 4, East Charlotte. Elaine Powell, the Vice Chair, District 1, which is the northern part of the county. Susan Harden, District 5, the South Charlotte Wedge. And Susan Rodriguez-McDowell, District 6 in Southern Mecklenburg. Thank you all.